Welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher podcast, brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk, in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. Hello, I'm Adam Smith, and I'm delighted to be hosting this show today for the NIHR Dementia Researcher podcast. Uh, to fill the gap left by the cancellation of the SFN conference, the Alzheimer's Association followed up on their extremely successful AAIC with the Neuroscience Next conference. Taking place virtually over the 9th and 10th of November, the conference showcased the work of students and early career investigators in cognitive, computational, behavioral, and other areas of neuroscience research. But for me, one of the most exciting parts of this conference has been how early career researchers have been so obviously at the center of everything. Organisation, chairing sessions, leading the talks and uh, kind of covering subjects which were of interest to them really have been very obvious uh, as, as long as with all the numerous support sessions that came with that as well. Um, so we usually only have two or three panellists today, but just for once, I'm slightly daunted and excited that we have not one, not two, not three, not even four, but five panellists. And as a very first for our show um, all four of our panellists today are from outside of the UK. So hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be joined by Lindsay Welkovich from a PhD student from the McGill University in Canada. Hi, Lindsay. Hello. Uh, we have Courtney Klosky, who is a PhD student from the University of Kentucky, who I'm sure all of you have been listening since July will remember Courtney was with us uh, talking about the AIC conference back in July. Hi, Courtney. Hi, everyone. We have first-time contributor B. V. Belendra, who's an MD candidate from St. James School of Medicine in the U.S. as well. Hi, V. Hi. Uh, Dr. Wade Self, who's a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Chicago. Hello, Wade. Hello. And uh, Joao Pedro Ferrari Souza, who's an MD PhD student from Federal. Oh God, shall I have a crack at this? Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil. Hello, everyone. Well, thank you very much for being with us in our virtual studio today, everybody. Um, we um, always struggle to keep to time, or particularly I do when I'm hosting this, and I can see that I'm going to be terrible today with five people to talk to, this, particularly with such great content, because what we're here today uh, to, to talk about is this AIC Neuro Next conference, and in our one of our usual reviews that we do where we're going to recap on the event and discuss what uh, we've seen and heard over the two days which were earlier this week uh, to share our highlights um, so that listeners can perhaps I think I don't know if you can still register but uh, listeners can perhaps direct it to particular sessions that excited us for those that are just playing catch up now or for to uh, at least hear what we enjoyed so they can maybe go look up the people that contributed. Um, so I'm going to come round now and do a a set of introductions and Lindsay I'm going to come to you first if you could maybe uh, uh, give us an introduction of yourself. Yeah sure um, so I actually just defended my thesis at McGill so I'm a recent graduate and sort of in an awkward transition between PhD to postdoc um, and I had a really great experience helping uh, helping participate in the program committee for the conference this year with Courtney and a bunch of other really fantastic early career researchers um, and some professors who really created a wonderful space for us to, you know, take charge and really voice our opinions and, um, and help include what we thought was important for other early career researchers. Um, so, and yeah, during the present, during the conference, I was lucky enough to give a lightning presentation, um, which was during the neuroinflammation session, and it was hosted by the Immunity and Neurodegeneration PIA. So I really encourage you uh, to go check out the Vimeo video. Actually, we had some glitches in the morning, so I think I would check out the Vimeo instead of the actual session recording. Um, but yeah, I had a really great experience overall, and I'm really looking forward to going through the highlights. Brilliant. And I'm sure everybody uh, on the podcast today is going to congratulate you on successfully surviving and, and defending your thesis. Congratulations. Well done. Oh, thank you very much. It, it was it was a hurdle indeed with COVID-19. But I mean, it was a unique experience because, you know, you got friends to be able to see it over Zoom, which, you know, otherwise wouldn't be able to go in person. So it was it was strange, but it, there were its perks as well. So it was great. Thanks. Uh, so you did do this virtually, did you? This was over camera to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Exciting. And did you dress for the occasion still, or did you and and sit there neatly and very upright and from we, the we waist had... up? Certainly, we got brows <laughs> up, pajamas down. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, one of our other podcast hosts, Anna Volkmer, uh, who's a speech and language therapist looking at communication difficulties, she did exactly the same thing. She just defended her thesis as well back in, I think, April or May when we were in lockdown. And she's written about that. So um, if anybody's listening who's in that situation, uh, in likely to be in that situation in the next coming few months, please do uh, have a look at that blog or drop Lindsay a line. I'm sure Lindsay would be happy to share her tips on how to do that virtually. Absolutely. No, just offering you up for that there without really asking you in advance. <laughs> and Courtney, let's come back to, to you, if you could uh, introduce yourself. And did, you did present, didn't present? Yes, I oh. did present. Um, I'm Courtney, and I am a fourth year doctoral candidate at the University of Kentucky in the Sanders Brown Center on Aging. And my mentor is Donna Wilcock, who you might have seen on a few of the panels during AIC Neuroscience Next. Um, and yes, I did present a virtual poster. And because of the new virtual format, this conference, we decided to make everybody record a three minute talk of their poster. So if you want to hear me talking about my project instead of AIC, where I just put up a poster, you can go watch it. That's brilliant. I don't know about everybody else, but I really love that format. I quite like the kind of being able to look at a poster and see a little film of the people uh, talking to um, those as well. I, I think they should all be collated and put into YouTube because I'm sure they get lots of hits um, just and doing that job we've been do, talking about before of trying to spread the science as well. Thank you very much for joining us today, Courtney. Um, v, let's come to you next. Um, so I am an MD candidate uh, from Chicago, Illinois, originally from Toronto, Canada. Um, and the love of science brought me to the US. Um, so this was my first poster uh, ever. I've done like um, presentations in the past for like health fairs, but that was more assigned. So this was the first time I could venture and do something that was interest to me. So my interests were in uh, neuroinflammation, oxidative stress, free radicals and antioxidants. So I put that to use um, and I uh, pre um, created a poster, submitted it, and um, it's been a great experience. I'm pretty, I'm very happy that I actually took the plunge and submitted it to uh, Neuroscience Next because I've gained such a great community from this. So I'm really happy and well, I'm definitely signing up for um, more conferences that are coming up in the next year. And I know we had a chance to chat yesterday, but I thought what was really exciting. So you're um, fundamentally, you're a medical student. You're not, a, you're not a kind of neuroscience you're not doing a PhD in neurosciences, you're a medical student, but this is pursuing your own passion and your own interest, which I think is really exciting. Yeah, it's like, um, it's like a hobby. It's uh, the fact that I was thinking like, with all this um, uh, knowledge and like, I'll pick up knowledge as in like reading um, articles and listening to podcasts. So I thought, let me put it to good use. It's just kind of sitting up there. Um, and I found like little different patterns just when I'm reading stuff. I'm like, hey, there's there's this, uh, this concept that keeps recurring, um, there, there might be something in there. So then I thought of just uh, making a poster. And I also, uh, this, again, with the whole pandemic situation, because rotations were um, kept at a minimum, I had an extra time. So I also wrote up a manuscript on my own. <laughs> so <laughs> You know, everybody else in this podcast right now is, hates you. <laughs> The fact that you can, oh, do you know what? I've, I've just got some spare time. This is a bit of a hobby. I'll, I'll get published. I'll do a poster and a presentation just, just for fun, really. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was fun, actually, starting, starting, like, especially when you don't have the, the guidance, you're sitting there like, what exactly does the abstract mean? What, does, like, what exactly are we doing when we write an introduction? What, what is an impact factor? So all these things I learned over... Um, this pandemic experience so it was it's it's been, it's been good it's been good that's really cool and I mean and you are a, exactly the kind of things that so many governments and places across the world are trying to kind of target is undergraduates medical students um, and, and kind of nursing and allied health professions to kind of be inspired to consider research as a career in the longer term or at least uh, 
undertake research alongside your your job uh, and to be research minded from that kind of early stage right from the outset is is fantastic and, and it's exactly what we need more people to, to do if we're going to rise to this challenge. Thank you very much um, for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to come to uh, Wade. I'm going to come to you now. I am a new postdoc in the lab of Dr. Sam Sisodia in the neurobiology department at the University of Chicago. I came to the lab via my dissertation at Washington University in St. Louis, working for Tim Miller and Randy Bateman. And I spent the past two years in an industry postdoctoral fellowship program at AbbVie Pharmaceuticals here in North Chicago, Illinois, um, in the drug metabolism and pharmacokinetics department. So for someone transitioning back into the academic environment, I feel like this conference was an outstanding opportunity, especially for networking with colleagues that I hope will be with me in Alzheimer's disease research for the next 30 years. These are the early career investigators. They'll hopefully be launching labs together and you could potentially form lifelong collaborations with these people. So also hearing about the science that these people are doing is valuable. But when we saw the advice from the career panels and understood the stories of both some, some senior uh, and well uh, established PIs, but also those early career investigators who aren't that far away from where we are right now, being able to hear their candor and, and give advice in, in a more friendly environment um, for early career researchers, I thought was a very powerful experience to have at this stage, um, given everything that's going on in the scientific community. So it's really interesting when you talked about that difference between being in industry and coming back to academia, which isn't a story that's often captured. I mean, it's people going the other way, right, that we, we talk to most often and coming back in this direction. So in terms of getting back into this, is this because when you're in industry, you're kind of locked away in a cage somewhere? Right? Are you in a dark room and you don't get to engage with the community? Do they lock you up or... Or do you just find that they work you so hard you don't get a time to read papers and go to conferences? So oh, I, sh I, I should say, qualify this, shouldn't yeah. I? Because, because that might put every listener off ever going into academia, uh, into industry. <laughs> I wouldn't say that's necessarily the case. I would say there's a lot that you can learn from industry, especially being in a large organization. And I think one of the things I saw firsthand was the value of networking, where there are so many departments roles and responsibilities that come together in drug development. And you need to know those people. You need to know who you're sending your samples to, who you're receiving them from. And you see the power when people are aligned with one goal, we're going to develop a drug that you can get a lot of great science done. And I think that's something that should be applied anywhere you're at in understanding the network of people and how you can form a team to answer the most pressing questions that are out there in our science. So I would say it was a very positive experience and it helped me also understand at a personal level where my research interests were. And I found at this stage, you know, that's in the academic environment right now. And I think certainly there are lessons to learn for academia from industry, that kind of, as you say, that ability to, to, work across different departments and cross teams so you bring together kind of you know biologists with chemists with with you know in people in different areas to to work together which is so often doesn't happen in academia but uh, well thank you very much for joining us today Wade it's really great to have you and um, last of all I'm going to come to uh, Joao to ask Joao to ask you to introduce yourself. First I would like to thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this podcast episode I'm very happy being part of it. Well, my name is João. I am a PhD, MD, PhD student at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. It's a university located on the very south of Brazil in a city called Porto Alegre. I think this can be a little bit confusing, be an MD and PhD student, as we talked the other day. And in, it's because in Brazil, we have the opportunity to do the medical school simultaneously as the PhD. So. Currently, I am on the, my third year of medical school, and I'm on my first year of my PhD 
at the biochemistry department under the supervision of Professor Eduardo Zimmer. And my research focused on understanding the vascular risk factors contribution to the etiology of Alzheimer's disease and its progression using neuroimaging and fluid biomarkers and also using cognitive testing. And I, uh, I think this virtual approach of the, um, as AIC had and now AIC Neuroscience Next is very, very interesting for mainly like uh, people from developing countries as Brazil, because the funding from the government on research is not so, is very scarce right now. So it's a very good opportunity to get us involved in the dementia field. And because have a lot of great scientists, I know from Brazil, involved in the Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and frontotemporal dementia that are very good scientists and wouldn't have the opportunity to be involved in such events. Thank you very much. And I mean, you make an important point that I know we've talked about uh, both in the show and outside, uh, outside in our day jobs as well, is about how whilst clearly the pandemic's been I mean, terrible, I mean, uh, for across the world, I mean, absolutely devastating. There are some positives which have come from this, which we hope will carry on um, once we can put this to bed and move on and things like the ability to network it the field the world has felt rather smaller in the last uh, six months particularly and you know the AIC being not this kind of conference that costs you know four or five thousand dollars to go to from somewhere else in the world with the ticket price and the flight to the hotel has been brilliant as you say I think there were so many people from Brazil and from, from Africa and other parts of the, from Asia as well that managed to make the conference this year that would never normally have it because their departments don't have the budgets to go. And so it's fantastic and really great to welcome you today. And let's hope that those connections uh, stay uh, even once we've got a vaccine and we're, we're back to normal in a very short space of time. I'm gonna be super optimistic about that next year. Um, thank you very much to all of our panelists to join us today. Um, can you believe we're already 20 minutes into this <laughs> in our half an hour show, which I'm sure will be slightly extended. So apologies to everybody. Maybe this will be your something to listen to when you commute to and from work today. Uh, for those that are still going into the office anyway. Um, Courtney, I'm going to come to you for your first question because... As I mentioned in the introduction, what's clear is, is that early career researcher interests um, have run through the heart of this conference. It's been a kind of constant strand throughout it. And I know that that started right back in kind of August, September, September, when the conference was first being um, thought about in that early career researchers were the people that sat on the panel organizing this. This wasn't a large committee of internationally renowned researchers from across the world. It was a small group of awesome early career researchers of which you were one of. And I'm, I'm gonna point this out as well, Lindsay, you were as well, right? Um, but I, I'm gonna to come to Courtney, first of all, to ask uh, what, what was that like to be in, in that place? It was a fantastic experience. We. Um, there was kind of a group of us that Claire reached out to um, a few days after the SFN conference was canceled and was kind of asking us what we would be interested in seeing in a conference as early career researchers would we want to be networking with other early career researchers or other people in the field and what type of career panels were we interested in seeing and just kind of all of these questions to start formulating this conference and then um, we kind of took that and we were put onto the scientific planning committee. And I think over half of the committee, I think, um, were early career researchers. And so we were really able to talk about what we cared about. Um, and that was like going with the near peer conversation. So undergrads being able to ask grad students questions. We all thought of that and we were like, that's something we wanted to have seen when we were coming to grad school. So let's give that to the next generation. And that's kind of the same with the grad students asking postdocs questions is we wanted to be able to give back what we wish we had um, and what we can benefit from at the same time. And so that was a great experience to be able to come up with all of these ideas. And we were meeting every other week as a big group. So we got to talk with 
Dr. Claire Sexton and Dr. Maria Creo and kind of get all of the ideas flowing. And then we were able to go into more into smaller groups and kind of come up with what we want to see in the plenary talks. And I was in a small group of like four people discussing what we wanted to see for that. And um, kind of all of the ideas were broken down into smaller groups and we were able to really have deeper conversations and then come back to the whole group and be like, what do you guys think of all of these ideas? Um, so that's, that's, that's. it was great planning. And Lindsay, would you would you add anything to that? Putting you on the spot there. No, not at, I mean, I know I had pretty limited involvement with the Alzheimer's Association before this year. And, you know, since I've been able to participate in so many different programs, it, it's really been such especially in Canada, we don't have something like the Alzheimer's Association that that's, that has that much reach and is that big. So it's really been a unique opportunity that I'm, I'm really grateful for to be able to meet people like Courtney and some of the other early career researchers that I really hope to be able to meet in person one day. <laughs> but it's really been a unique opportunity. And I really hope that, um, you know, being able to watch the conference unfold from, you know, this perspective of Courtney and myself, I really hope that other people thought that it was as helpful as we had intended it to be <laughs> so yeah I'm I'm really I'm really glad that I had the experience and I would really encourage anybody else to you know get involved with the Alzheimer's Association the PIA and you know reach out to Claire if you want to get involved in other community activities fantastic so um, am I reading here that the kind of a good lesson learned takeaways for anybody listening is if if they do have an opportunity to get involved in organizing in a conference or event um, you you'd encourage them to do so Absolutely. And it's it's a fantastic experience to see, you know, at such a young stage in our career, what goes into planning a conference and sort of the things that we have to consider and, you know, who, who would be most topical to, to speak on certain scientific issues. And so that was a really interesting experience to see how everything goes on behind the scenes. Um, so yeah, I'm really glad that that we did it. It's, it's really fantastic experience. And I think I, I com- that's great to hear. And I think it's exciting to to get some people out of the lab as well doing some things that they otherwise wouldn't get an opportunity to do and these are skills that you can then apply elsewhere later on whether that's doing public outreach and engagement and organizing events like the pint of science things that go on elsewhere in the world or joining in science fairs these are all things that skills you learn you can transfer um thank you very much for sharing that for us courtney and well done to alzheimer's association for involving early career researchers across the board and for everybody listening yeah I think um, this is a good point for me to plug for I'm sure most of our listeners would have heard the podcast we put out last week uh, which is on the new I start professional interest area to elevate early career researchers Um, that's uh, a new PIA that I'll be chairing for the next couple of years and uh, we hope to have an opportunity to steer uh, things like the main conference in future the main AIC to offer more support for ECRs and to look at what we can do in particular countries as well to cater um, for the needs of specific countries rather than this just being something that's in the US as well. So do go ahead and join the PIA on the iStart website. And at the moment, I think you can still get that for half price if you join really quickly. Um, Right, I'm gonna come to each person now to ask for their highlights. Um, First of all, I'm gonna pick on UV to uh, tell us, you obviously presented a poster. You're welcome to talk a little bit more about that as well. And I'd love to hear what, what were your highlights for the conference? Um, yes. So my poster, just a quick run through. Um, my poster was um, in regards to the neuroprotective um, effects of astaxanthin, which is a um, potent antioxidant made by microalgae and um, the potential in slowing down the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So this is um, what, uh, so I looked at this um, um, carotenoid and um, it, the, the special thing about this carotenoid is that it spans the entire cell membrane. So therefore in terms of uh, like, in terms of free radicals, um, there's um, oxidative stress 
is seen as one of the pathogenesis with Alzheimer's disease, which contributes to um, the deposition of amyloid plaque and tau phosphorylation. So um, just making that imbalance of oxidative stress with antioxidants just um, at a homeostasis, um, astaxanthin helps to reduce the amount of free radicals. So I collected, um, so my paper was literally a review um, poster on all the information that's out there about astaxanthin and its uh, therapeutic potential to Alzheimer's disease. And what I gathered was that um, mice in vitro, uh, in terms of in vitro, mice who have been supplemented with astaxanthin, there is a decrease in amyloid deposition over time, over like a 12-week uh, period. And they have um, studied that in um, clinically with uh, elderly patients and their um, memory in terms of if they, if they were, um, if they had memory impairment after 12 weeks of supplementation, um, these patients actually had an improvement in me memory and psychomotor speed. So that's pretty much what my poster was. And with, in terms of highlights, um, I particularly liked a poster um, done by Josephine, a, I'm going to probably not say her last name properly, but Iposto, and she's from Trent University, and uh, she's a, a master's student, and she looks at uh, TDP-43, and I didn't know about TDP-43 just because I'm well-versed with, you know, when, it's, when you think of Alzheimer's disease, you think of beta amyloid and tau, uh, tau protein, but TDP is actually a natural occurring uh, protein. And from what I heard of, found from her poster is that um, there is misfolding in there. And then the misfolding and aggregation of this particular protein um, is found in ALS and uh, frontal um, uh, FTD. So her, her lab is studying um, this misfolding and how, um, how this misfolding occurs through microscopy microscopy and um, uh, so she's inducing this misfolding she's inducing um, and um, when she when she learns about it uh, she'll find in the future her plan is to find uh, with her lab inhibitors for this misfolding and this is a new new protein that they um, they did that not her but like that came out in 2004 so it's relatively new and it's a um, new area of research and I was just shock because everyone just talks about like, you know, beta amyloid and tau. Um, so this is, uh, this was very new to me. So I thought that was very interesting. Fantastic. We, we did actually do, we did a podcast a little while ago with uh, Professor Louise Serple from the University of Sussex on misfolding pro proteins, which is the focus of, of their lab as well. So if anybody, if anybody listening would like to know more about misfolding proteins and how those work, kind of have a scale back. I think it was earlier on this year, right at the start of this year. That's, fasc uh, I mean, really fascinating. I, I have to confess, I don't know much about the science of your work that you specifically mentioned, Does, but if any of our panelists know more about that and ha would have questions, then please, please do chip in now if you have questions for V. Everybody's shaking their heads, not your field. <laughs> But um, if anybody who's listening does have questions about V's research uh, on this topic, then please, you can't find her on Twitter because she's not on there. So. Oh, well, yeah. but I was suggested, I was uh, recommended that I should have Twitter. So I'm probably going to have tw Twitter by the end of this podcast. Brilliant. Well, when, by the time she has Twitter, we'll make sure that her link to her Twitter feed is included on her bio on our website and alongside the text that goes with this podcast. Uh, and of course, you can find her poster um, in the uh, pre-recorded content on the AAC Neuronext website. So do go and have a look. And thanks for highlighting your your favourite moments. Um, I'm going to come to just so I go in order. Wade, I'm going to come to you next. Great. So I'll say my highlights from this conference, the theme is a holistic view of whatever you're looking at in terms of research. I think it's interesting in thinking about in vivo systems and the whole body, not just the brain that is near and dear to our hearts where we're seeing these pathologies, um, as well as the whole Alzheimer's disease research space and some career development panels and plenary sessions that really highlighted those aspects for researchers that may be really focused and homed in on what they're doing in lab right now. 
So I think in terms of the science, you're biased towards looking for things that are very similar to your research. So in the Sisodia lab at the University of Chicago, my research project is beginning to interrogate the mechanisms that are mediating the gut brain axis and how that may contribute to neuroinflammation that is then causing or playing a big role in initial amyloid deposition in preclinical Alzheimer's disease models. So first search term I go to the poster session is microbiome. And there was a nice presentation by a postdoc at UT Health Houston, um, Vijayasri Giridharam. And the title of that poster was Altered Microbiome After Sepsis Accelerates Cognitive Impairment in an Alzheimer's Disease Model. And I thought what was very interesting and nice to see in her presentation was actually seeing a altered cognitive phenotype where our lab has been very focused on the molecular and cellular phenotypes that are observed with altered microbiota perturbation and how it influences amyloid deposition. Um, but this presentation actually suggested that you do see a cognitive phenotype as well. Um, with an induced sepsis model from a, a surgical procedure. And the other theme um, from the lightning rounds that I particularly wanted to highlight were the protein clearance lightning round and um, the stroke and vascular contributors lightning round. Because again, thinking holistically about pathology accumulating in the brain, but what are those external influences, a particular influence on the cardiovascular system, what's getting into the brain, what's being blocked from getting into the brain, and how are things getting out? So just a couple of people I wanted to highlight from those lightning rounds, if you think about the protein clearance, um, Dr. Sandro Demesquita, uh, who is just starting his lab at the Mayo Clinic um, in Jacksonville after doing a postdoc um, in Yoni Kipnis's lab who was originally at the University of Virginia, but now is at Washington University in St. Louis, um, looking at meningeal lymphatic clearance. And what I really enjoyed about the work that Sandro is doing is he's looking at molecular mechanisms, but he's also looking at trying to answer some of the problems in current therapeutic applications. So actually using a mouse monoclonal antibody targeting amyloid beta that's being used right now in human clinical trials. It's the mouse version of aducanumab and showing how manipulations of that um, lymphatic clearance system can actually impact the efficacy of these experimental therapeutics. So hopefully that's where we can see a real taste of translation in the preclinical work and how that may actually influence a future clinical trial. Uh, when Biogen's probably going to go have to go back to the drawing board or get more creative after the recent FDA uh, comments they've received from their filing for aducanumab. It's not looking particularly promising right now. Um, and then another person I would like to highlight um, is Anusha Mishra um, from the Oregon Health and Sciences University in terms of what their lab is doing in terms of manip manipulations of mild stroke um, and ischemic events and looking at the molecular changes that are underlying those things. Because, you know, coming from my perspective in uh, drug development, those are some big challenges right now is understanding, you know, the flux of how things are moving. When we take a therapeutic, is it going to be effective? And I think these are some of those mechanisms when you think about the bloodstream is how things are going to get into the brain. We're not doing a lot of injections. Um, like we do in our animal models into the uh, ventricles of, of human brains that, that are living with these disorders. So I think holistically, as you think about all the problems that need to be answered for transformative medicines to come to light for Alzheimer's disease, these are some of those um, research questions that need to be addressed, not just these um, molecular pathways initiating A beta, tau deposition, testing the amyloid hypothesis, but all these different factors holistically have to come together for successful therapeutic development. Thanks, Wade. Um, your last point there about delivery has reminded me of a, there is a study at um, uh, the Rice Center in Bath in the UK looking at uh, drug delivery, which is direct to the brain, which has been quite exciting and um, uh, I know there was a whole documentary in the UK about this for Parkinson's disease, which is worth a look if you 
if you haven't heard of that. The microbiome's cool. Do you know what? It keeps coming back. It, it, I think the AIC, you can't help but go to that and see that every year there's suddenly there's a hot topic, right? I mean, last year, I'm thinking 20, 2019, there was a lot of talk about uh, uh, astrocytes and, um, and microglia was a hot topic then. I think the year before there was, it was all blood-based biomarkers. And I'm sure it's not that long ago that I went to an AIC where the whole buzz was about microbiome. Um, so it, it, clearly these things kind of move up and down. Are we about to go into an exciting phase for your research, do you think, in the next year? We'll see. I mean, if you want You're to say it's always exciting. search of, <laughs> if you look up uh, Hemraj Dodia's work um, from Sam Sisodi's lab at the University of Chicago, Sam's given multiple presentations. I think there are some nice initial steps towards the, you know, we think about the cool biological phenotype that we first see. But I think as early career researchers, the easiest question, if a PI is in one of your talks or giving a presentation and you're just showing a phenotype, what's the mechanism <laughs> of that? that? That's a question you hear all the time in these talks, if there's no molecular markers or signatures that are, that are currently defined. And I think the, what I'm excited about is, is getting into that um, and teasing apart those actual mechanisms. What are the molecules, the cells that are involved in this, in this potential interplay? So uh, more to come, hopefully, over the next couple of years. Absolutely. And, and we all know this has been talked about so many times. It's very unlikely to, that there's going to be any one single course to this in the end, right? I mean, we go, we, it's going to be a makeup of so many different factors that contribute to this. Um, and that's an important, important work. It's interesting you talk about this holistically as well, because I know this this stepped in to fill a gap of the SFN. I know Courtney mentioned that I did in the intro as well. It's a little bit different, I guess, because one of the good things, the S SFN conference is so huge that you can fall into a room that's talking about something you've no idea about, but you do pick up something and you kind of walk away from that. So it's it's been nice to have the flexibility to, to go across and look at other things. It's a slight shame that we do then only really still attract dementia researchers i do wish that some of these conferences particularly now that they're virtual that that we'd attract some people from other disease areas and equally that some of us would go off and look at you know cancer conferences and cardiac conferences and some of these other things just to get some new ideas sorry wade you were gonna come well, back. yeah so so i want to at least in in terms of improvement there certainly can be from the scientist level but with that thought in mind one of the things uh, I wanted to highlight in particular was the cross-disciplinary research, plenary sessions and panel discussion. So at least taking a step in the right direction where maybe investigators aren't coming into dementia, but maybe we can be more creative and extend out into other spaces. Just like you said, what are the combinatorial factors that may be influencing aging overall and disease later in life? Um, I would point people to the cross-disciplinary research panel discussion in which there were representatives from the Autism Research Foundation, the American Heart Association, and the Epilepsy Foundation. And they have calls and proposals out, and they are encouraging pre-doctoral and post-doctoral researchers specifically with their fellowships. And I think there are some exciting avenues where us as scientists we can see the type of research that they're interested in looking at how it relates to the dementia field as well and thinking of creative strategies to address questions that are overlapping in different research disciplines and areas. And you have email addresses if you go to that plenary session and panel discussion where you can reach out to those people directly. So in terms of networking and getting outside of the dementia space, I think that's a route that people could potentially go to um, in terms of finding some new people that may be interested in their research outside the field. I, I completely agree. And you know what? These things are easier said than done, right? I mean, at the moment, there's such uh, an explosion of so many different online conferences and webinars and seminars to go to, trying to find a balance on how you use your time effectively um, and don't overload on too much information is is tricky. But I think if you can find a nice balance, you you've hit You've hit the right spot. Thank you very much, Weird. That was that was really interesting to hear your highlights. Um, uh, Joao, I'm going to come to to you next. If you could talk us through your best bit. 
Sure. Like, uh, it, this event was like really amazing in, and had so many good presentations, especially for early career investigators as myself. So it's like some, a little bit hard to choose, but to make my highlights, I divided them into three domains, the historical, a scientific, and a career development domain. And I will talk a little bit about one highlight for each domain. For the first domain, the historical domain, I would like to highlight the plenary talk in the first day that was entitled Dementia Science, Now and Next, Why Dementia Science? The Scientific Challenge. This session was divided into two parts. The first one was presented by Oz Ismail from the Oregon Health and Science University, who told us about, a little bit about the history of Alzheimer's disease research. And besides being an amazing talk, what really intrigued me in his presentation was the fact that like for the past years, uh, I've been studying like very tiny details of Alzheimer's disease. And I realized I did not know many facts, important facts about dementia and AD research history. And uh, the most, the one that came to my mind was who was what Oscar Fisher? So if you don't know who he was, I truly recommend you to check out this presentation. And in the second part of the plenary session, Selina Ray from the University College London made a very great overview about our current stage in Alzheimer's disease research and made very cool insights about the next steps in the field, such as disease modifying treatments and genetic lifestyles interactions. In my opinion, this is a must-see presentation for those who are starting to be involved in the field right now and need to catch up with what's going on. For the second domain, I think uh, the scientific domain, I pretty much agree with Wade that we are very biased to look for topics that we know about and we are interested in. And perhaps my opinion is also biased in this topic, but for the scientific domain, I would highlight very much the lightning presentation round of the neuroimaging. This session really caught my attention in relation to the qualities of the presentations. And for those who are not aware, just as a quick explanation, the lightning presentation rounds were sessions related to a specific topic, in this case, neuroimaging, where students and early career investigators gave a three minute talk or last presentation about their work which is very, very hard, yeah? And it was followed by a live Q&A section. And in the neuroimaging session, there were four presentations that I will quickly talk about. The first one was given by Nikolai Franzmier, in which he addressed whether hypermetabolism follow a pattern starting locally and from there spreading throughout the brain connectome. And I thought it really interesting because his approach was based on what happens to other processes in AD, such as tau. So it was very, very good translational and a very good hypothesis in his work. The second, the second presentation was given by Sharon Lamb, where she presented her work with the aim to understand the effects of white matter hyperintensities, a surrogate for vascular disease, on memory and executive functioning under the perspective of the ATN system. And her conclusions basically suggest to include vascular disease biomarkers in the recent NIH framework. And it's, it's very cu curious, this approach, because we know that ATN system can't predict precisely the progression of a, a cognitive unimpaired patient to the Alzheimer's disease symptomatic phase so it's very interesting to think about other processes that are happening simultaneously in the brain and could contribute to the progression of the disease. Uh, the third presentation was Case and Robbins, where he explored uh, the correlations between retinal and choroidal vascular parameters with volumetric results in AD and MCI participants. And this is already like, um, Neopia, the PIA as an eye as a biomarker for Alzheimer's disease, 
that like is very curious to me thinking about uh, uh imaging i uh, imaging aspects of the eye as a biomarker for id really recommend to check and the last one but not least was jose contador who presented a work where him and his colleagues aiming to analyze both cross-sectional and longitudinal brain atrophy in a prospective early onset AD cohort. And the new in his work is this longitudinal atrophy approach in an early AD cohort. And uh, just to, finally, the last domain, the career development domain, as an early career investigator, I really enjoyed the career transitional panel related to academic career. This panel was moderated by Donna Wilcock from the University of Kentucky and Sydney Labuzan from the Mayo Clinic and counted with the participation of very important scientists in the dementia field. The panelists joined the section were Drs. Constanza Cortes, Dr. Dan Lee, Dr. Melissa Murray, Dr. Monica Rivera Mint, and Dr. Eleonore Drummond. And briefly in the session, we could hear advice and experiences of these respected researchers in relation to all kinds of topics, such as their favorite aspect of being a scientist, their balance between personal with academic life, and whether it's better to start a scientific career with a more risky or more conservative project. So I really learned a lot in this panel and made some very good reflections about my future career. I truly also recommend you to check out this presentation and really made a difference for me. Brilliant, thanks, Joel. I, and you highlight a couple of people there. I, I agree with you. I really enjoyed that uh, opening plenary session from Oz Ismail and Selena Ray, uh, both people who used to work with uh, us at UCL. Oz has hosted some of our podcasts in the past as well, and Selena was on our original steering group. So I'm slightly biased in agreeing with you fully fully there. And I do hope that Alzheimer's Association will make those two uh, sessions more accessible beyond just what was in the conference today, because I agree, I think um, quite a few people would benefit from those, because I know that um, as scientists, we kind of are often slightly um, blinkered in our view of our own small area of research. And I think uh, Oz did a fantastic job of opening that up and talking about the, the history behind the disease. Uh, which is something not everybody's aware of. Thank you very much. I realise, Lindsay, I, I, I've taken this out of order in the way I'd suggested and, and you didn't get a chance earlier on. So I, I, I was going to come back to you to say, could you maybe give us your highlights? And then I will have to go on, I guess, and mention my session as well, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so just like Joao, I also broke down my favourites. I mean, there were so many highlights, but I broke down my favourites into like, Oscars award category, uh, award set, uh, excuse me, categories. Does that so mean the, you're going to pick out a winner? So the first one is best science session. So my favorite was actually the translational neuroscience through precision medicine session. Um, and it, this was um, at, at the, the session, there was Maria Teresa Peretti and Whitney Wharton and Renaud Lajoie. And um, I, it was not only interesting, but the speakers were unbelievably succinct. I mean, admittedly, I, I had to be commuting during the session. I mean, such as like doing an online conference, um, but I wasn't able to see the slides, but I was still able to follow along perfectly just by listening. So the talks themselves were really fantastic. Um, and I think they were also incredibly topical because they were really effective at highlighting some significant blind spots in our collective research. You know, the clinical implications are really clear, you know, the inclusion of uh, different patient populations and analyzing more in-depth uh, sex differences also in our clinical work. But as a basic researcher, it also really highlighted the fact that, you know, we got to use male and female mice and rats. Um, when we try to use, you know, one, one sex in our, in our studies, it's to sort of make our statistics more robust by making our sample more homogeneous, but we're actually decreasing the translational value of our studies. So I thought that, you know, what they highlighted was really important for everyone who was in attendance. And I would really encourage people to go view that. In the outreach category, my favorite session 
and I'm not biased because Adam Smith is here, was uh, the panel discussion uh, that was uh, that featured Lisa and Jim Butler and Jim and Karen Weed, who are two couples that are living with an Alzheimer's dementia uh, diagnosis. And I've been training in dementia research for seven years, which like in the grand scheme of things is not a very long time, but it is a long time to not have seen an interview like this at all during my training. Um, and you know, when I think of Alzheimer's, I think of the end stages of disease, you know, that involves more uh, physical and mental handicap. And it was so incredible to hear the perspective of people that, you know, seem perfectly normal and perfectly healthy in my eyes. Um, and just to hear their perspective and how they're living with their diagnosis was really a unique opportunity as someone who, you know, is at the bench every day and is not involved with patient work that often. And excuse me, um, one thing that I really, I, I literally wrote this down because it was such an incredible quote. Jim Butler had said that enrolling in clinical trials and encouraging others to do the same makes him feel like he's fighting his own diagnosis. And that really hit hard. Like, you know, if they could be at the bench working every day as hard as we would, they would definitely be doing that. And it's it sort of put a lot of responsibility on us as basic researchers to be accountable to the people that we're helping, not only the taxpayers who are funding this research, but the patients who are actually living with the disease. And so that was that was really um, that hit home, I think. Um, and, you know, Jonathan Schott also um, mentioned that, you know, we as researchers have to be accountable um, and we have to be able to explain and justify our work and be able to communicate it, not just to the scientific community, but also to the patient community. Um, so I really love that session. And, you know, if nothing else, I think it was just a, a nice, um, you know, it wasn't very scientific, which I liked. It was different. And so I would definitely encourage uh, anyone tuning in to go check that check that session out. And then lastly, I won't spend that much time because I know Joao and Adam has already uh, mentioned the session. The best communication session award goes to the plenary session that was uh, given by Oz Ismail and Selena Ray. Um, and I mean this in the least patronizing way possible because Oz's presentation was just adorable and it was so creative and accessible and it was just such an excellent example of effective science, science communication. Um, I, I honestly think the, the talk could be used as like a learning tool, both for, you know, people who are just coming into the field for the first time, and also as a tool for patients to be more and, and the clinical community to be more aware of, of their disease and sort of the history of Alzheimer's disease and just to educate themselves as well. And then obviously Selena Ray also did a fantastic job following up on that talk, um, and she was able to really effectively compress a vast amount of research, which can be really overwhelming for people just enter entering the field. And it was really digestible and accessible across basically any research discipline. Um, so that was my award for best scientific communication session. Um, and there were so many other great nuggets that, uh, that the other panelists here have highlighted. Um, but yeah, those were, those were the best, I feel. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Very succinct. That was a nice romp through your highlights there, which I really enjoyed. And I agree. I think uh, Jim and Lisa Butler and Karen and Jim Weed from the Alzheimer's Association's Early Stage Advisory Group were fantastic in coming forward. And they, I mean, they really have kind of lived it. I mean, it's interesting you say how they seemed so well and that, I mean, you can't help but think that's partly down to that they've absolutely followed the kind of instructions that you would be given uh, for anybody in their circumstances, which is they went and got diagnosed early when they spotted problems. They didn't kind of bury this or bury their head in the sand about what was happening uh, to the, their lives and these memory blips, I think, as as Jim described them as. They, they went very early on to the doctors. Um, they got a diagnosis early and then they, and it's interesting because this wasn't even given to them necessarily as medical advice. I, I gather their, their healthcare professionals sent them along their way and said, right, thank you very much. We'll, Good luck then. We might see you again as things deteriorate. But they went away and looked at what they should do and they followed exactly the rules. You know, they're taking the right combinations of vitamins and exercise and keeping their brains active and and they're eating the right foods and they're doing all the things that you would encourage and hope people would do that will um, extend uh, their, their lives and, and uh, make the progression of the disease slower. Um, which will just buys them those extra few years with their family that, I mean, we know some of the treatments, even if had you can you mab have been licensed last week, that's all it was ever going to do is to just buy somebody a little bit more time and until you can, you as the amazing scientists can 
find out what the real problem is and resolve that for us. Thank you very much. If you wouldn't mind doing that maybe next week, that would be quite handy. <laughs> Um, no, I thought they were really great, and um, I was uh, delighted to be invited to chair that session as well. Um, in that, I did actually talk about that. I would try to make a case that there is a reason why lab-based scientists, and there are mechanisms by which they can can do meaningful public engagement. And it's it's interesting because I think this is where you have to make a distinction between public engagement, public involvement and public participation, which are three different things. And it's possible to involve people or engage them or um, in, in different ways. And I, since that session, I kind of started to put my head around how I might write a blog of something that lab-based scientists could have a look at and go, oh yeah, we could do that. And I, somebody pointed me to a, a great uh, report that uh, Animal Research Nexus published last year which talks this is a uh, report on um, how the public can be involved in animal testing laboratories which is obviously controversial in some ways but um, and they give, it, give out a great list so I would uh, go to animalresearchnexus.org and have a look at this there's a report on there and they highlight these are the things that they believe and I'm not going to say lay people because I know Wade doesn't like the term lay people this is non-scientists could, uh, could be involved in this. So there's attending engagement events and visiting laboratories to learn about research into health conditions. So open up your labs and invite people to come in. I know at UCL, they have these days every year where school children come, but open up where you can, invite people in. Obviously tricky right now, uh, given even you can't get into labs, but down the line, hopefully that's something that's more possible. Um, you can involve the, you know, the public in setting research priorities, agendas, devising strategies, having, having people on your panels that are doing those things is, is quite feasible. Um, helping develop research proposals. I know I can't think of a single research funder that doesn't look more favorably on a grant application that's had some kind of public involvement in, and a statement that says from the public that says, we think this research is important. We can understand where this is important, particularly when you're applying to a charity or a, a government that's using public funds uh, they want to know that this is research that the public want to see as well so that's helpful um, the public can be involved in deciding what research to fund by taking place in uh, grant review boards doing some ranking scoring making decisions about whether research uh, addresses important question important and relevant questions for them um, when the James Lind Alliance in the UK did a priority setting partnership a few years ago, the top 10 priorities nearly all came out as care research because the people completing the surveys were um, family members of somebody who was living with dementia who'd gotten later in the stage of the disease and it was care that was important to them. But if you were to repeat that survey in people like um, Jim and Lisa and Karen and Jim that joined in our panel, it would almost certainly be ways to progress. It would be treatments and understanding this to prevention. Um, other suggestions they make are um, shaping ongoing research. They're involved in being involved in steering groups, visiting researchers and laboratories to kind of just offer to monitor what's going on. Um, and then disseminating research findings, which is something we absolutely know as scientists, we all need to get better about 100% across the board. Gone are the days where you can simply publish your findings into some academic journal and then them just be buried in amongst everybody else. Just And the only feeling of value is how many citations you get. That's, that's not good anymore. You need to be out there sharing this, disseminating your research in meaningful ways. And I don't see any reason why lab-based researchers uh, can't do that any more than qualitative ones can or those who are working in direct care or or involved in diagnosis. Actually, if you don't mind, I, I, sorry, sorry to interject because Jonathan shot like he highlighted that perfectly. He, I think he said he wanted to create a loop in science where, you know, basic research is obviously informing on, you know, potential therapy, ther excuse me, therapeutic strategies in the clinic, but then it has to go the other way as well, right? This work that they're doing in the clinic also has to inform basic research. And that goes towards scientific communication and outreach and informing patients as well. It's not just about the science, but it's also about getting, getting involved in all aspect, aspects of Alzheimer's and dementia, the research community. So I think you highlighted that, your point very well in the session. 
Absolutely. And and I mean, I, I need to work a little bit more on making my case for why you should make time to do this, because I know that um, I personally feel like involving the public in my, my uh, research and my work uh, is valuable. Um, I gain a lot from it. And I think um, people on more lab-based science will do the same. Um, it, it kind of helps motivate you as well when you start to see the people that are going to benefit when you're having those kind of tough days. It, it's what keeps me, you know, keeps me going to work every day is knowing that there's a, and I mentioned this in my introduction, but a line of sight between me and my work is really important to it. It's, it's what motivates me, not, not making money, not kind of, you know, personal kudos. It's, it's helping people, right? That's why we're all here. That and the discovery. Go on, Wade, Adam, I'll give add. you a suggestion uh, for, for that strategy and how you think about it. Um, I think often as researchers, we have to get funding. We have to get a grant and then do the work. And that's a very transactional relationship. But I think one of the biggest takeaways I had from your session, people living with these diseases are brilliant. They are creative and they have incredibly valuable insights. And instead of this transactional relationship with the community where you're hoping maybe one day I'll be able to give you a drug based, based on my funding, creating an integrative partnership where, like Lindsay described, understanding where are the translational gaps and where can you find opportunities to do experiments also that more similarly mimic what is going on in the real world. And we're all creative people and have our own unique capabilities. And I think the more diverse opinions you have than just the scientists in your group at a lab meeting trying to solve all these problems will help us get to that solution faster. So an integrative partnership with the community is crucial, even if you're a wet lab scientist at the bench doing molecular studies. I completely agree. And, and you know, more often than not, even in people with early onset uh, Alzheimer's disease. These are people who've got a whole life of experience in their chosen profession to also bring to this. I mean, we, you know, I think uh, Karen and Jim, uh, he'd been an engineer. She was involved in teaching. The, the others had been involved in addiction services. These are all, they've got, you know, 50, 40, 50 years of life experience from different professions that they can bring to this challenge. Um, and and share their experience. And that goes across the board from engineers and data scientists and people who've worked in, in the care sector. Everybody can contribute, I think. Um, and there are so many fantastic citizen science projects as well starting to spring up across the world. I was talking to somebody this morning that's got a program called Dementia, um, Dementia Inquirers that received a lottery grant in the UK to give research funding to, member, uh, to members of the public living with uh, with the disease, small grants for them to do their own research. They've got uh, partnered up with a researcher so that they can get some advice on methodology or how to apply for ethics if they plan to publish. And then they are literally doing their own research and publishing the findings. Um, there are so many ways to involve people with this. And I think all of them uh, enrich and, and improve us in so many ways. Um, we're a bit short on time now. We've, we've kind of over uh, about an hour into this, there was one session which I can't help but I, I need to mention this, which was the career development panel for undergraduates, the SEND con sponsored one, which I know, um, Lindsay, you talked about mine very graciously, thank you very much. And um, I'm gonna talk about yours and Courtney were both on the panel uh, along with uh, Wagner Brown, um, Claire Latter from Edinburgh, Grace Lloyd from Florida, uh, Roy McKennell, uh, McReynolds III from UCLA. Um, and uh, Jade Jada Lewis from Florida. I'm struggling to read my notes, which I skipped down really quickly. This was talking about uh, a subject which next week's podcast is actually gonna be on. Uh, our podcast in two weeks time is with four early career researchers who are in their first year uh, of their PhD. And we're gonna talk about how they uh, have uh, found ways to find their feet in their first few months or some of the anxieties that they've experienced and it's really interesting. I, I hope all the people on next week's podcast go back and listen to this session because I think they would find it valuable. Uh, at the start, some of the advice coming through was in the early days to particularly, I'm going to summarize this really quickly, was but to be patient, not to get too stressed out at the first few months. If you don't know what to do, you're going to ease into this. It's a long-term 
um, program, which I think is very important points and ones we've made before as well. Um, some key bits like asking for retro letters of recommendation while people remember you and things to just make yourself memorable to people so that you're not blending in amongst so many other uh, students if you can do that. Um, uh, we've talked about this as well. James uh, did a webinar on this about finding the right lab. It's something we've also done a podcast on before as well about, you know, think about you as interviewing the supervisors, not just as you deciding if they'll choose them you've got to find the right fit for the lab and if you find somewhere that's really formal or informal you'll know what suits you best so important things to look at when considering the program um, taking the time to join particular study groups um, honestly I, I've got pages full of notes here that I'm not going to get time to go through today so I would highly recommend you go and look at that session and if I get time I'll, I'll maybe make that into a nice little blog to align with our podcast in two weeks time. Um, I'm really sorry to rush this, this through, but I, I'm feeling suddenly that I'm living up to my reputation of, of not keeping things to time. And, and of course, with nobody commuting right now, um, this is gonna be something I hope people are listening to in the kitchen, perhaps while they're cooking a nice, a nice dinner or enjoying a glass of wine while they're doing it. Thank you very much uh, to all of our panelists today. Uh, Lynn, um, I'm going to give you your proper names and bits and pieces when I can find my piece of paper. Uh, we've got Courtney uh, Kloski. We have uh, V. Bala. We've got Wade Self. Joao Pedro Ferrari from Brazil. And Lindsay Welikovic from Canada. Thank you, all five of you, for taking time to join anything today. Um, did you have any final points? I'm quite happy to take if anybody had any final comments before we, we wrap up today. So I have one more just to kind of hit on my science points. And I think all of the talks you guys talked about are great. Um, this is more of a shameless plug to a poster that I'm kind of involved with. It's for the A Minder podcast, which is basically a podcast that's every month recapping all of the papers that were published in that last month, giving little tiny summaries. So if you want to check out the poster of how they do that and check out the podcast as well, it's called A Minder, A-M-I-N-D-R. Um, I, I wasn't on the poster, but I am now involved in the podcast. So I just wanted to give the poster a little shout out. Are you, are you promoting Maybe the competition? Uh, no, this is not a competition. <laughs> no, I'm, te I'm, te I'm teasing. Podcast is a great community. It's a fantastic uh, medium of of sharing and a great way to engage I hope other people and if anybody's thinking about starting a podcast and would like to come and chat to us about how we went about that please do drop us a line sorry Lindsay did you have a point to make as well yeah just that it was a Canadian initiative so that's myself shameless plug right there <laughs> well and and I think V said she you had to leave Canada to do good science earlier I think that was <laughs> she didn't really I answer. am offended <laughs> but I do want to say something um this uh, this conference actually made me appreciate the research behind medicine. You know, um, I um, I saw it from a clinician's point of view. You know, when we have geriatric patients with Alzheimer's disease, we're just trained to look at symptoms, we treat, and we're good to go. But because of this conference, I have this like appreciation for research, and it's it's like a symbiotic relationship, right? So it's the researchers with the clinicians working hand in hand to um, um, to help these patients living with um, uh, this disease. And um, I'm happy that I got to be on the other side of it because um, uh, what I realized is without research, there is no medicine. And it used to be like medicine, medicine, clinical medicine, but how are, as a, as a future uh, physician, how are, how are we coming up with these drugs? Or how are we uh, prescribing these drugs? It, it's the research. What Absolutely. we get in the textbooks. Is and, and, research. And, and even then, even when you're talking about pharma and things, the original concepts that is often in academia that then passes across to, mm -hmm. to pharma companies to, to look at those. I mean, that's how the uh, drug discovery institutes work in Oxford in the UK and in London uh, is this academic in, and uh, industry partnerships mm -hmm. to take those ideas forward. Thank you very much uh, to all of our panelists. Once again, uh, Lindsay, Courtney, V, Wade and Joao. Um, we have profiles on all of our panelists on the website, which includes details of their Twitter feeds, even including V, who's now gonna go and create one. So do give her a follow as well. 
Uh, please check them all out. You can catch up on what you missed via the conference's on-demand content. Uh, is that for the next month, Courtney, or is that for longer, depending on if you're on iStart? I believe it's a month for everybody, and then I think that you can still do that extra month, same as AIC, for the two months if you're an iStart member and you have that coupon code. So be sure to use it and join Adam's new uh, ECR podcast, uh, Pia. Absolutely, so go away, have a look at the um, AIC Neuronext website um, where you can still access this content for a month. Um, finally, please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review of our podcast. Um, uh, as you'll have heard last week, we've just celebrated a hundred episodes, um, which we're very excited by. And there is a competition running up at the moment. Whereas if you uh, register on our website, and then tweet your favorite podcast highlight using the hashtag ECR Dementia. You can be in with a chance of winning a Sonos speaker in our competition prize draw, which we'll do at the end of November. Um, and if you're a new listener, do web register on our website because we send out a Friday bulletin, which has um, all, all kinds of blogs talking about science and career topics. We also uh, capture all the UK uh, funding opportunities and jobs and lots of content on our website. So please do pay a visit. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I hope you will all join us again uh, in another episode. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. <laughs>